Hi, good morning. Um, my name is Sue Gardner, and what I'm going to be talking about here today is how the internet is breaking our democracies and what we can do about it. Um, and the reason I come to this topic is because it was just about a year ago, a year and a couple of weeks, uh, that we, living in the United States, woke up to find that Donald Trump was going to be our new president. I'm a Canadian, but I do live in the U.S. I was deeply, deeply shocked, and I was really surprised. It hadn't ever occurred to me that he might seriously become the president of the United States. And so, in the aftermath of the election, I participated in a bunch of journalistic post-mortems. I talked to a lot of friends. I did a lot of my own research. People I knew were involved in research. And we tried to kind of put the puzzle pieces together and figure out how that had happened. Um, and what became a kind of inescapable conclusion was that the internet, and specifically social media, had played a pretty large role in him becoming president. And so that is why I'm coming and speaking with you about it today. I think we need to understand our recent history. We need to understand what has happened so that we can prevent ourselves from just continuing to make the same mistakes over and over again. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Um, before I start, I have a warning and a disclaimer. The warning is this deck includes a lot of imagery that was shared on social media during the 2016 presidential election campaign. A lot of it is inflammatory, a lot of it is false, and some of it is objectionable or offensive. And my disclaimer is that I am going to restrict myself to talking only about um, the internet, particularly social media in the election. There's a bunch of other things I could talk about, but I'm not going to. And so this slide can function for us as a kind of a parking lot. So these are explanations that were put forward by media and by pundits in the weeks and months following the election. The reason I put them up here is to say I am not going to speak to them today. They're all interesting. I am interested in them, but I'm not going to talk about them for this talk. I just don't want you sitting in your chair thinking, how can she not have mentioned James Comey? I'm not going to mention James Comey. That's not what this is about. So, I want to take a minute for us to remember the early to middle days of the internet. So, when the internet first came along from 1990 until maybe as recently as 2005, 2007, 2010, we felt, I think, many people felt many different things, but I felt, and many of us felt, that the internet was going to have a great leveling effect and a kind of democratizing effect on people. Suddenly, for the first time, we could communicate across large distances instantaneously with people pretty much anywhere in the world. Uh, Countries that were repressive, authoritarian regimes had a harder time censoring news and information, and so their people had access to material that they hadn't previously had. We started seeing sites, sites like Wikipedia develop, and even the mainstream media itself, which historically had uh, taken a kind of a gatekeeper function by accident, it couldn't do otherwise. Even the mainstream media was kind of opening up and we were seeing that people were now having access to what was in effect their own printing press, their own ability to publish. That was gonna open up and democratize access. People would get a voice who had historically been marginalized and disadvantaged. And so we thought, or many of us thought, that the internet was gonna be a great thing for humanity and make us wiser, smarter, more compassionate. In the intervening years since then, I think we can now pick out, there are three, what I would characterize as sort of troubling trends or precursors that kind of point the way to the election result in the United States. So I'm gonna talk through uh, these three things that some were visible at the time and some are probably only now becoming obvious to us in retrospect. The first is that the internet famously um, has broken the news industry, famously and accidentally. It used to be that news, it was possible to have a news company that was profitable and successful. Throughout much of the 20th century, that was the case. In those days, ordinary people, you and me, we did not pay the full costs of the news that we consumed, and we did not have to, it wasn't necessary. And that was primarily because of advertising. So advertisers were heavily subsidizing the news industry. That was broken accidentally by the internet. 
Today, we find ourselves in a situation where roughly 80 cents of every digital dollar, which today is most dollars, um, that is spent on advertising goes to Facebook and to Google, and that leaves about 20 cents, depending on the numbers that you look at, about 20 cents left for everybody else, which includes the news industry. And so the result of that is that the news industry, their business model, their revenue model, has been essentially shattered, and they have a lot less cash to work with than they used to. You can see that in this chart, and if you're involved in news or you hang out in circles that care about news and the future of news, you've probably seen a version of this chart before. We call it the holy shit graph. And it shows the cliff, right? So you can see a very healthy industry for decades and decades, and then around about 2000, the revenues just fall off a cliff. The end result of that has been in the United States today, we have about half the number of working journalists that we had about 20 years ago. The picture is a little bit different depending on the country that you live in, but the story is essentially the same. And what I would say is that we are only now at the very beginnings of feeling the societal impact of that loss of journalists. The second trend I'm going to call out is that the internet has developed into a machine for micro-targeting and persuading people. For the first 10 or so years of the internet, it didn't really have a business model. Um, and there is a guy in California who runs a website called Pinboard. Pinboard. His name is Maciej Czavglowski. And Maciej says the business model for the internet was initially storytelling for investors. And so you went to VCs and you told them a story about how you could achieve you know, hockey stick growth and you would make a lot of money in the end. If you could persuade them, you got a lot of money to work with. The internet now has developed a business model. It's developed two. One is um, for some kinds of entertainment properties, subscription model is working. And for practically everything else, including the news media, the model that has taken root is one of advertising. <clears throat> but advertising on the internet today is radically different from the advertising that our parents were used to. <clears throat> so here's how advertising used to work. You wanted to reach a lot of people, and so what you did was you bought time on television programs or in print media, and that worked okay. And in doing that, you were only able to very loosely target groups. So you could target you know, American families or people living in Toronto or teenagers, but you were really only able to target big, broad groups, and you couldn't actually be sure that you were going to reach the people you were trying to reach. That has all changed today. So today, let's say this is me. I join Facebook, and when I join Facebook, I voluntarily give up a certain amount of information about myself, my gender, the city that I live in, the college that I went to, and where I work. And then as I wander around the internet, I'm constantly exuding more information by the things that I like, the things that I tweet, the stuff that I comment on, things that I buy. I manually update my own profiles. And so I'm constantly sort of putting out a fog of new data. That data is collected, for example, by Facebook, but not only by Facebook, and put in a container which is named for me and specific to me. Now, if I were an advertiser and I want to reach people like me, I would do that through Facebook. I would use the create ad link, which is accessible to anybody. You don't need to be, I, I can make ads on Facebook. I could look for women who are adults, who are college graduates, who live in San Francisco. I could narrow it to women who were originally from Canada. I could narrow it further to people who are interested in technology, and then I could narrow it even further, let's say, to people who are fans of Margaret Atwood's book, The Handmaid's Tale. That would spit out for me the 1,500 people in the San Francisco Bay Area who match that um, profile. And then, as an advertiser, I could, for a really small amount of money, $30 or $100, I could target those very specific people with a specific message. So this is brand new, right? You could not do this 10 years ago. The third trend or precursor that I'm going to call out is uh, social media. So social media has, again, this is an accident, but social media appears to have accelerated and deepened a hyper-partisanship that has always existed in human society. Um, it has made it worse. So when the internet first came along, 
a new capability that publishers got was for the first time we could see how people were actually interacting with the content that we were creating. We could see where they came to our sites from, we could see what they clicked on, how long they stayed on that page, and where they went to afterwards. This was a new capability, and what it gave rise to was a kind of you know, never-ending A-B testing. So we were constantly looking at the performance of the headlines that we wrote. We could test images against each other, story length. And so we could continuously optimize all of our work to make it likelier that people would click on it and would want to share it. And this eventually developed into a reasonably profitable business model, especially if the material that you focused on was stuff that was intended to entertain people. You didn't need the heavy costs of like international um, foreign bureaus. You didn't need a lot of copy editing. You didn't need a heavy research team. And so you could actually make money doing this. It turned out that social sharing was driven largely by emotion. And it turned out that the emotion that was the easiest to sort of produce on a predictable basis was anger. And it turned out that the kind of content that most predictably elicited anger and therefore social sharing was politics, and it was specifically hyperpartisan political coverage. And so that's how we developed hyperpartisan news. It grew out of clickbait and it grew out of our ability to optimize stories. So hyperpartisan news, this is from a BuzzFeed story that was done a couple of months ago where they tracked the development of hyperpartisan news websites. And what they found was there was a huge spike in hyperpartisan sites just in the last sort of 18 months prior to the election. And so recapping, we're going into the 2016 election campaign and here's the situation that we find ourselves in. We have a news industry that is weak, confused, it's disoriented, it's distracted, it's anxious about its future. We have a new ability to micro-target people that we have never had before. And we have a huge upswing, which is brand new, in hyperpartisan websites. And so what happened? By the 2016 election campaign in the United States, we had developed a whole new ecosystem of far-right, hyperpartisan news. And you can see it in this chart. This was uh, published in the Columbia Journalism Review. It's an analysis of um, the sharing of election news on Twitter during the month of October. And what you see is the bluish purple circles, those are news sites, election news sources that were shared by people who supported Hillary Clinton. There's a small number of green circles, and those are sites that were shared by both Hillary Clinton supporters and by Donald Trump supporters. And then in the red is the sites that were shared solely by Donald Trump supporters. So the sites that were shared by Hillary Clinton supporters, they, on average, were founded in 1965, and they were founded as early as 1843. These were sites that are long-standing conventional news sites, the Washington Post, The Economist, uh, I think CNN, The New York Times. By contrast, though, the Donald Trump supporters, they were sharing sites that were, on average, founded in 2006, and the earliest one of them went back to, I think, the middle 90s. And those were sites like Fox News and Breitbart, and also sites that are lesser known, probably, but you may have heard of them, especially in the postmortems to the election. Gateway Pundit is one of them. Ending the Fed is another one, and Truth Feed. And so these are brand new. This ecosystem of far-right news sites are really very new in the American political landscape. And so let's take a look at how they, oh, I'm sorry, there's also this, yeah. So this is the same data, but just framed a little bit differently. You can just see the red, again, is the Donald Trump supporters, and you can see it's all brand new. So let's take a look at how that fits into the sort of broader election news ecosystem. What you can see in this slide is um, hyperpartisan news sites are on the left. They are created as BuzzFeed did a bunch of investigation to them. They described them as being created sometimes by people who were ideologically motivated, but mainly really by people who BuzzFeed characterized as opportunists, growth hackers, and internet marketers. So there were people who wanted to make money, they wanted to build profitable websites. They weren't motivated by partisan interest. During the election campaign, um, what they did was they published uh, four million 
um, posts, 186 new websites published 4 million posts. Those posts got the most engagement on social media of any election-related coverage. So they got more engagement than CNN, more engagement than the New York Times. They collectively were shared hundreds of millions of times on Facebook. To the right of the hyperpartisan news sites on this chart, we see the Internet Research Agency. I'm curious, how many people here know what the Internet Research Agency is? Okay, yeah. We're only really, there's been a little bit of journalism about it, but we're only really beginning to hear more about it, particularly, I think, with the U.S. Senate investigations into um, how Russia was involved with the election campaign. So the Internet Research Agency is a Russian company it is sometimes called a troll factory or a troll farm. And what it does is it, it works on social media to amplify and sort of extend and, and put forward the ideological messaging of the Russian government. It is not um, a body of the government, but it is apparently funded by the government. And what the Russian Internet Research Agency does is it hires young people, usually students or recent graduates. They work four days a week, 12-hour shifts. They go on the Internet and they spread misinformation and disinformation that, again, is in keeping with the propaganda aims of the Russian government. And so they comment on news stories and they run a bunch of Twitter accounts and they tweet a lot. Sometimes they write blog posts. And during the U.S. federal election campaign, they went online and, and pretended to be Americans. So they posed as Americans and participated in political conversations as though they were Americans. We are learning now from the Senate investigation that the Internet Research Agency apparently spent $2 million or a minimum of $2 million during the U.S. campaign. They bought a bunch of ads on Facebook, they bought a bunch of ads on Instagram, and they ran something like 2,000 Twitter accounts during the campaign. You can also see on this slide, aside, slide, slide uh, the role that Russia Today played in this, RT, and the role that WikiLeaks played. So RT, which is the state broadcaster of the Russian government, creates a bunch of messaging that, of course, is in line with, um, with what the Kremlin wants to have out there. A lot of that material was picked up by these hyperpartisan news sites, and a lot of it was further amplified and extended and augmented by the Internet Research Agency during the campaign. We also know, of course, that WikiLeaks played a big role in this election campaign for the first time. Um, they had leaked to them the hacked DNC emails and the hacked John Podesta emails, and they sort of dripped them out on the internet through pretty much the entire campaign on pretty much a daily basis, and all that material was picked up as well by the Harper Partisan sites and also picked up by the Internet Research Agency. All of this material was amplified by Donald Trump and, and various sort of Republican supporters of him, and so during the entire election campaign, we sort of existed on the internet in this sort of fog, this sort of miasma of, of misinformation and disinformation and propaganda. It was very hard to see where it was coming from. It wasn't visible to everybody. It was sort of circulating in pockets of the internet, but it was decisive in the election campaign. So what kinds of stuff got made and shared during the campaign? Some of it was like this, and I would say that this kind of thing just falls in the realm of ordinary political opinion, right? I say something, do you agree? If you agree, please share it. Some of it, though, was what we now have been calling fake news, and so it was posing as news material, but it was not factually accurate. This was the most popular election news-related story shared on Facebook during the 2016 campaign. Of course, it is entirely false. It actually came on the heels. There was first a story that the Pope had endorsed Bernie Sanders, later a story that the Pope had endorsed Hillary Clinton, and this was the last story that the, post, that the Pope had endorsed Donald Trump. And this came from a site called Ending the Fed that only um, spun up, I think, about a year ago. And then there was this kind of material. So I would characterize this as both false and highly inflammatory. And this is the kind of thing that I saw a little bit of this stuff coming through my feeds during the election campaign. I had a very hard time figuring out how somebody could see something like this and attach any credibility to it, but it seems like some people did. 
and even more so stuff like this. Are you familiar with Pizzagate? I'm assuming, yeah, everybody is. Yeah, and so this was, you know, uh, ludicrous, incredibly hard to believe um, conspiracy theory that said that the man running Hillary Clinton's uh, campaign and his brother and a number of other prominent people in the Democratic Party um, were running a secret pedophilia uh, sex child trafficking ring out of the basement of a pizza parlor in Washington, D.C. Again, it was super hard to believe this, but people did believe this, and shortly after the election, as you probably know, um, somebody turned up at this pizza parlor with a gun, expecting and hoping that he would be able to liberate these children. So what was the purpose of this kind of material? Some of it was fairly straightforward. So this is an advertisement that was put on Facebook. It was paid for by the Russians. Facebook disclosed that the other week to the Senate investigation. Um, and what this ad says is you can't vote for Hillary Clinton because she is a Satan. Um, and you should vote for Donald Trump because even though he is not perfect, he cares about America and he's an honest person. So that's pretty straightforward. This is another advertisement um, that the Russians purchased on Facebook. This one is a little bit less clear, I think. It was uh, put out during the Democratic primaries, and I think that the purpose of it is to persuade Muslim Americans to back Bernie Sanders in the primary. Later on, um, this is an ad that Donald Trump's campaign bought on Facebook. This came out after the primaries, once Hillary Clinton had won the nomination. And the purpose of this image um, is to uh, target Bernie Sanders supporters and amplify and reinforce their feelings that Bernie Sanders had been hard done by during the primaries. This was another Donald Trump campaign ad. This one was targeting young liberal American women. And the point of this was to persuade those women that Hillary Clinton was not their friend, that she was not a feminist. And then similarly, there was this, and this was targeting black Americans and um, reminding them of the mid-90s when Bill Clinton was putting out the crime bill and Hillary Clinton was supporting him in that. And this is misquoting something that she said in the 90s. But the goal of this is to uh, persuade black people that Hillary Clinton's not their friend. And so the purpose of all of these messages, it was this miasma, this fog of stuff the purpose of a lot of it was not actually to get people to vote for Donald Trump. The purpose of it was to dissuade people from voting for Hillary Clinton, and, and more broadly and more generally, to kind of spread feelings of fear and uncertainty and doubt and sadness and alienation. Uh, there is a Russian op opposition activist who talked to the New York Times about the Internet Research Agency, and he said this, specifically about the Russians. He said, the point is to spoil everything. The point is to create an atmosphere of hate, to make the internet so stinky that normal people won't want to have anything to do with it. And I think a number of us, including me, we had that feeling during the campaign, right? I remember going on Twitter and seeing sort of political fights or, you know, even on Facebook, um, and really wanting to just withdraw from the political and the social spaces on the internet. It was just really unpleasant, it was really divisive, people were incredibly hostile to each other, and, and I'm a Canadian, I found myself despairing and feeling very alienated from the people of the United States, and I think at that same time, a lot of Americans were on the internet and they were feeling the same way. So, all of this is bonkers, right? And so a question is, is, is it legal? How much of this is legal? And the answer is, in the United States at least, almost all of it is legal, and there is nothing constraining anybody from doing all of those same things again. So in the United States, it is perfectly legal to spread a bunch of misinformation or disinformation, um, including for pay. There are limits to that, there's libel law and slander law, but typically it is perfectly okay to make and share misinformation and disinformation, it's perfectly okay to amplify it, to spread it around, it's perfectly okay to pay other people to spread it around. The one major exception to that is uh, information designed to lie to people so that they cannot vote. There were some advertisements or some posts put on Twitter and Facebook during the campaign 
that on the day of the election that told people um, you don't have to go to the polling booth, you can actually just text this number to be voting. That's not true. They don't have voting by text in the United States. And so if, if, if a determination, if they found the people who did that, they could choose to prosecute them. But a lot of the other stuff that happened was completely legal. It's perfectly legal to run bots on Twitter. It's not against Twitter's terms of service, and it probably shouldn't be. The kind of micro-targeting that you can do with advertising, including but not limited to Facebook, it is also perfectly legal. There is nothing um, about it that is not okay. The one exception to that is uh, non-Americans are not allowed to expend uh, funds to persuade Americans to take a particular stand during their election. That's why the Senate is having the hearings that it's having now, and it can and probably will stop in future non-Americans from spending money on advertising during the Amer American election campaigns, but that is just a very, very narrow slice of what happened during the last election. The vast majority of what was done was completely legal. So, through all of this, what was the conventional media doing? And I am very sad to say, and you probably already know, the conventional media was doing a really, really bad job. That looked like this. So this is a um, Gallup poll that was carried out every day during the election campaign. And what Gallup did was it called people up and it said, in the last day or two, what have you been hearing from the media about Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton? When you look at the word cloud that resulted from that for Donald Trump, it's probably pretty much what you would expect, right? It's a mix of policy things, immigration, Mexico, I think the wall is in there, and then sort of process words, president, speech, Obama, people, etc. The one that is anomalous is the word cloud related to Hillary Clinton, right? And if I had asked you, and I didn't ask you because it's too cliche, but if I had asked you what word do you think of when you think of the coverage of Hillary Clinton, you would have said email. That's why but her emails is an internet joke now. Um, so there was a lot of coverage of Hillary Clinton using her own server when she was the Secretary of State, and then further coverage later of the hacked emails from the DNC, and then even more coverage after that of the hacked emails of John Podesta. But really, the coverage goes beyond just the emails. When you look at the words here, it's kind of extraordinary, right? You see scandal, you see lie, you see FBI, you see the Clinton Foundation, which was a problem for her during the campaign. You see the word liar. You even see pneumonia and sick and ill. So if the job of the news media in an election campaign is to ensure that people have the information that they need so that they can make good decisions about what to do when they go in to vote, clearly that didn't happen here. Similar research uh, from the Berkman Klein Center at Harvard University came to a similar conclusion. They looked at the entire corpus of uh, text that was produced during the election campaign. They found that when it came to scandal-related coverage, Hillary Clinton got twice the scandal-related coverage um, as Donald Trump did, which is really something when you think about Donald Trump and who he is. And when it comes to issue-related coverage, Hillary Clinton got half of the issue-related coverage that Donald Trump got, which is, again, kind of extraordinary when you consider that she had you know, briefing books like this, and he really didn't. So again, you know, we ask ourselves, why did this happen? I think there are probably two reasons. The first is what I said earlier, which is the news media is dramatically under-resourced compared with where it was 20 years ago. And so I think it would be unrealistic to expect to get the equivalent quality of coverage from an industry that has lost half its resources. So that's one thing, is that it's just under-resourced relative to what we're used to. But I think the other factor, um, when I was online during the campaign, just like wandering around the internet, I would occasionally sort of fall into conversations that were happening with reporters, um, with people on the internet talking back to them. And occasionally I would read the comments on news stories on sites like the New York Times and the Washington Post. And what I found when I did that was I, I really did back away quickly because the conversations were so deeply unpleasant and people were really like berating journalists and telling them they had no idea what they were doing and they were missing the boat and they were doing a terrible job and they were underestimating and Donald Trump would become president. And I felt like 
reading that stuff, even at the time, I felt like had I been a working journalist during the campaign, I think I would have felt destabilized by that, right? I think I would have felt off balance and kind of defensive. And so I think, you know, there's a money piece here, the resource issue, but I think there's also a kind of a psychological piece, which is um, if you berate people and make them feel terrible, they are going to be off balance and they are going to do a less good job. So, how do we fix this? And I'm about to wrap up, and if I have left enough time for questions, I can talk more extensively about how we uh, might fix this uh, during the Q&A period. Um, but I want to leave you with just one sort of major thought. Because of the people who you are and, and where you work and what you do, I think the most important thing that we can do in this room is aim to make user pay the future for the internet. I seriously think that's what it really boils down to. There's a famous line which is, if you're not paying for it, you're not the customer, you're the product. And I think that's what we're finding with the internet. Um, it wastes a lot of our time. The advertising is leading us to places that are not useful for us. Uh, most websites are not working for us. They are selling us to advertisers, and that is clear in the way that they interact with us. And I think that there is one counterexample that kind of is worth taking a look at. So I was the executive director of the Wikimedia Foundation for six years. And when I was there, we did a lot of things that I am very proud of. Probably the thing that I'm most proud of is the business model that we developed. So if you don't know, the Wikipedia, the website, is backed by the Wikimedia Foundation, which is a registered nonprofit charity in the United States. It is almost entirely funded by user donations. And so it's ordinary people, dentists and grad students and parents giving 10 or 20 or 30 dollars. That model, what it does, is it virtuously lines up the Wikimedia Foundation with the people that the Wikimedia Foundation is trying to serve. And I think if you look at Wikipedia, you can see the difference, right? It's not trying to trick you, it's not trying to trap you, it's not trying to make you stay longer than you want to, it doesn't use a lot of bad patterns. And I think in a broader level, at a more important level, it is genuinely trying to serve the people who are paying its bills. I think all organizations orient towards their sources of money, and I think if we want to fix what is clearly going wrong with the internet, which is not helping our society, I think the simplest and the easiest way to do that would be to try to institute user pay models so that our organizations that operate the websites that we all use can be run in a way that services their end users. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm just going to ask uh, one quick question so sure. we don't run over too much. What um, I think over the time uh, we talked a lot about how to be a source critic user, how to know if something is fake or if something is real. And at least here in Sweden, I mean, you worked as a journalist in, in Canada uh, for the CBC. Yeah. Um, we talk a lot in Sweden about how to make sure that young people, especially students, can evaluate sources and understand when something is real and when something is not. At the same time, we at the Internet Foundation in Sweden uh, do a, a yearly survey here in Sweden of internet use, and we found that the, is the oldest people, the people exactly. over 60, who are the least source critical, who are the least aware of what constitutes real news and fake news on the internet. And they will say so themselves when asked, do you know how to evaluate sources? They say no. Uh, so what do we do? Because obviously I think a lot of these older users uh, relied on newspapers and classic journalism to tell them what's going on in the world. And now that the internet is telling them what's going on in the world, they don't, they don't have the tools can we give them the tools? What's your idea? Yeah, um, you're, you're exactly right in your diagnosis of the problem. I, I've seen exactly the same thing, and we see it in the United States. And what it looks like in the United States is I think it's called Fox derangement syndrome, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. Which is exactly what happens. And, and I think the problem is, and I see it with my own parents, the problem is that 
um, older people grew up in a time where there were gatekeepers, and so they came to trust. They never learned to distrust, and so now suddenly, you know, everyone has a printing press, and they they have always been taught that if it came to them from a third-party source, if someone bothered to publish it and and sort of disseminate it, that meant that it was either true or it was close enough to societally understood to be true and would be repudiated if it turned out to be false, right? And so their entire mental frame is really wrong. And I see that with my own parents when they share mm. chain emails with me and stuff like that. They're just not thinking critically about it. And what's funny about that is that, of course, the ways to determine credibility on the internet are exactly the same as they ever were for magazines and newspapers. It's really simple things. It's like, are there a lot of spelling mistakes, yeah. right? Does it seem to make sense? Is it reasonably well written? Does it look kind of semi-professionally produced, right? None of those are, are, are new tests to be putting to ourselves. Um, so I actually don't have an answer for you, right? I think, it's, I think it's a really, really serious problem and it's a huge contributor to what's been happening in the United mm -hmm. States. But I don't, know, I don't know what is the best thing to do about it. I, I hope that it simply changes over time. Yeah, we'll just have to yeah. keep thinking and keep working at making sure that more users know how to evaluate sources and yeah. how to determine. We have a kind of a robot theme this year. So mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. speaker gift this year is a little cute little robot, but <laughs> he will believe everything that's on the internet. So please make sure <laughs> that you tell him what's right and what's wrong. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, much for your very interesting Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good job.